Our next speaker is Morgan Puchek. He's the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for ProMedTech. He oversees their commercial activity in the Veterans Administration, as well as taking initiatives with the Department of Defense and DAPA. He's done some clinical uh, studies in the VA health system regarding non-narcotic pain management solutions. And he's got some upcoming multi-center trials on blood flow and osteoarthritic pain management. Today, he'll be speaking about shortwave diathermy and its role in non-narcotic pain solutions for both veterans and active duty patients. Hi, my name is Morgan Puchek. I'm here to talk to you today about the Replexa Plus therapy system. I'm the vice president of sales and marketing for ProMedTech. Uh, our product is FDA cleared on federal supply schedule. And if you'd like to learn more, uh, please visit us at promedtech.com or replexa.com, that's R-E-P-L-E-X-A, where you can click on the contact us and send a message directly. So what is Replexa Plus? Replexa Plus is a form of shortwave diathermy. Our value prop is to provide positive, consistent outcomes on hard to heal patients. These are patients with a high rate of readmittance um, who may not be seeing success with standard modalities in their treatment conditions. Our therapy uses a technology called shortwave diathermy. What is shortwave diathermy? Shortwave diathermy is a form of electromagnetic radio frequency that operates at 27.12 megahertz because that is the frequency at which the body will respond in some manner, which we'll discuss shortly. Um, we are typically tuned for soft tissue and it can also be used in hard tissue. Shortwave diathermy as an electromagnetic falls under the same therapy tree as things like MRIs and CT scans or bone growth stimulators, where the therapy provides a treatment but can't be seen or felt. Within that uh, shortwave diathermy tree, we really have two main things that we modulate, the delivery mechanism and the power settings of the therapy, which result in a classification from the FDA and then subsequent indications. So when we discuss a delivery mechanism, there's really two delivery mechanisms that can treat, uh, can deliver shortwave diathermy. The first is a capacitive system, which means point to point. Typically, this is something like a TENS nature. Uh, energy has to go from a positive to a negative lead. And in doing so, it typically won't move directly through the body. It always takes the path of least resistance, which means you're going to be going through the superficial soft tissue and fatty subcutaneous uh, layer. An inductive system is something akin to a speaker. They're magnetic in nature, and the energy flows away from the applicator. What's good about this system is that there's no end point. It can treat deep tissue if the power settings are high enough. So in discussing power, within the technology, there's really three settings that we can modulate in regards to the therapeutic effects of shortwave diathermy. The power, which is how much energy we're placing into the body, the pulse rate, which is the number of pulses per second or some other measure, measurement that we determine how many pulses are, are occurring, and the pulse duration, which is the length of each pulse. Depending on how we modulate these three settings, the FDA will classify us under one of two classifications, IMJ or ILX. The controls for an ILX therapy are that the therapy has to be pulsed and non-thermal. It has to have a non-thermal response. Because of that, with an inductive system, it has to be low power. So a low power inductive system will also not treat deep tissue. An IMJ classification means that the body will have a, can have a thermal response. And really the power settings, pulse rate and uh, pulse duration settings can be modulated among any degree that, uh, that is safe uh, as dictated by the FDA. So ILX is a small limited subset of the IMJ settings that we can do. Replexa Plus is the only IMJ home care shortwave diathermy product in the marketplace. Anything else being used in a shortwave diathermy camp is an ILX device with very limited indications. So we have a classification from the FDA. And the next step we would have is the indications resulting from that classification. The indications for an IMJ device, the Replexa Plus device, are to relieve pain, increase blood flow to tissues in the treatment area, increase range of motion of contracted joints using heat and stretch techniques and reducing muscle spasm. An ILX indication is the adjunctive use in the palliative treatment of post-operative pain and edema in superficial soft tissue. So let's break those two indications down. 
starting with ILX. ILX has to be post-operative and superficial soft tissue, which means when you have a post-operative site, you've created an incision in the superficial soft tissue, the dermal layer. Because an ILX device has to be low power, it also is an adjunctive and palliative treatment modality, which means it is not treating the actual symptom or cause that we're working on. It's only treating the symptom, not the, uh, the actual treatment side of whatever we're treating. An IMJ indication has no qualifiers. We are directly indicated to relieve pain and to increase blood flow in patients with a vascular insufficiency if needed. Um, this can be, uh, because we have thermal, we can treat deep tissue because we're high power as well as superficial soft tissue, and we can be a standalone modality. So in summary, Troy of Diathermy, the Replexa Plus device specifically, uses an inductive IMJ classification to provide uh, strong field strength and thermal benefits, which can resolve the underlying conditions of whatever's causing that problem. All other competitors are ILX devices, which have a weak field strength, cannot treat the, uh, the underlying condition and only treat the symptom of those, uh, of those treatment sites. The thing that it does is it helps to manage pain. And we measure that predominantly through the rate of endogenous opioid expression, which is the way the body has a natural opioid response to pain management. This is our, a general study that we do again through the rate of mitosis, where we measure the increased rate against our uh, in vitro studies. The added benefit of an IMJ product is the thermal benefit. The thermal response has really two, uh, two results. One is the increase in blood flow, which we predominantly uh, perform through vasodilation at the treatment site. The other benefit of a thermal response is pain management, which has been studied for quite a long time with, with uh, results throughout healthcare. What we equate to the success of our therapy is what we've called the circle of life. Shortwave diathermy, the signal, can help manage pain and can help increase cellular activity. But when we do so, we're asking the body to perform at a more efficient and higher rate. In order to do that successfully, the body needs blood. And we can only get that through a thermal response. So with an ILX product, the signal is asking the body to do the same thing, albeit at a much lower depth of penetration. However, it's not supporting that increase in demand through blood flow because it has to be a non-thermal product. IMJ can prov provide the support of blood flow through our thermal response to the increased demands of the body uh, with the increase in cellular activity and pain management. So to sum it up, short wave diathermy, the signal, increases cellular activity and helps the body manage pain. And specifically an IMJ device, the Replexa Plus device, can help support that activity through an increase in blood flow, blood flow from a thermal response. So who is Replexa Plus for? We predominantly market to two people. And first, let's start with the standard protocol. In your clinics, your standard protocols are gonna work on about 80% of your patients or more. Uh, we'll use plantar fasciitis as an example because we see lots of plantar fasciitis patients in the VA. So a standard protocol might be icing and stretching and then orthotics and then some form of immobilization through a boot. And then we move towards invasive procedures such as a steroid shot and finally a fascia release, the surgical procedure. So when that standard protocol doesn't work, what happens? Replexa is for hard to heal patients. When those modalities aren't working and those standard protocols aren't working and you've exhausted lower cost, lower risk modalities, and you're now moving into higher risk, higher cost invasive modalities, that's where Replexa Plus is appropriate. We want to work on hard to heal chronic patients, patients with a high rate of readmittance to facilities. So when we're identifying a pain relief patient, we go through a standard protocol after several months or longer, pain relief isn't improving. There's a decrease in quality of life and there's a decrease in mobility. And the last steps now move towards invasive procedures. Those are appropriate candidates for Replexa Plus. We are a mid cost product. We're not the lowest cost product and we're certainly not the highest cost product or anywhere near the cost of surgical procedures. So we don't like to be a first pass patient, especially with things like pain relief. When we talk about wounds, it's a very similar structure. Standard wounds and stage one, stage two, you can treat through debridement and dressings and topicals. Uh, when you start moving towards uh, grafts, 
um, biologics, again, procedural based therapies. Um, as the cost comes up, this is where we start to become appropriate. When wounds move to stage three with no progress, that starts to become an appropriate wound for us. Or patients with a vascular insufficiency that may be impacting a wound's ability to heal. So we can be used anywhere on the body. We can be used on the shoulder, neck, and back pain. We can be used on the feet for plantar fasciitis or peripheral neuropathy or tendinosis. Uh, we can be associated work with pain associated with wounds or chronic pain. And within wounds, we are very uh, work very well on pressure sores and decubitus ulcers, venous stasis ulcers, diabetic ulcers, um, burns, and both graft sites as well as the graft donor sites. If you're using a graft, and you you can treat not only the treatment site but the donor site for a skin graft. The other person that we're for is for physicians and clinicians with a uh, high rate of readmits patients in their clinic. If those clinicians have a high backlog of patients or patients who are in the clinics very very frequently. Those patients can be a good candidate for us because we can take them out of the clinic, treat their condition in the home, assuming it's something that's an appropriate use of our product, and try to provide support to the clinicians outside of the clinic to help ease back some of that backlog. So we want to work on identifying not only the appropriate patients from a clinical standpoint, but also from a, from a volume standpoint in the clinics. If you have a single type of patient, that's a high volume, i.e. a, a high readmittance rate to plantar fasciitis patients. Um, those are excellent patients for us if they've passed all the standard modalities and are moving towards higher risk invasive procedures. So I'd like to move into the history of choroid diathermy and how it's transitioned to home care and why that's appropriate. And where I usually start is on the indications. Shortwave diathermy has four indications from an IMJ standpoint to relieve pain, to increase blood flow, to increase range of motion, and to decrease muscle spasm. If we put those into two blocks, the first half and the second half, let's start with the second half, range of motion and muscle spasm. Originally, the old devices were large, unwieldy devices. They were a mini fridge with a frying pan on top and they were used inpatient only. So because the IMJ therapies can provide a thermal response, patients would come into a clinic, something like PT, and the, if they were unable to get on a treadmill or a bike to warm up prior to, to stretching and doing their physical therapy, a clinician would bring over a short diathermy product and literally put it on the site that they want to PT out and turn it on to heat up the tissues to reduce the risk of injury. In order to treat those muscle spasms and range of motion, you want it in a high power acute setting, which was appropriate for inpatient. In order to treat pain and relieve blood flow, uh, or relieve pain and increase blood flow, we need to use it on, on a lower power over a much longer period of time. Our patients are on for an average of about four and a half months now. So with an inpatient product, the old technology, that just wasn't feasible. No patient can go to the facility twice a day for 30 minutes for four months. Um, they just don't have the time and it's not feasible for the clinicians to be providing that type of care. So what changed? Well, technology changed. Technology just got better. We use the analogy of a television where they used to have old large televisions and now you have small computer screens and the picture is more or less the same, but they're much more small. Uh, the same is for medical technology as you guys are all aware. We were able to use technology to create a home care product. So we can now provide shortwave diathermy with an IMJ product in the home for a long period of time. However, in doing so, we created a new problem or ran into a problem with any home care product, which is patient use in the home. Patient use in the home is a challenge we face on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's certainly something we haven't solved, but we'd work to address it. So if we talk about the clinical evidence, and I will discuss why we moved to this from history, we are a predicate 510K, which means our therapy has to be the same as the old products. There are 40 years of clinical data. We use unbiased clinical data. We use scientific data, again, like the in vitro studies to show the efficacy of the therapy. Uh, we do our own studies as well. Um, we can give you guys information on that. We are also doing VA IRB studies on different patient types that are using our product all over the United States. So if we have 40 years of clinical and scientific data that shows that this all works, and then we put it in the home and we get mixed results, that's because of patient use in the home we validate the issue that we face with that product. So in order to address patient use in the home, we as a company do two things. The first thing that we do is we have product features and benefits designed around one point. 
and that is ease of use. We want to make our product as easy to use as possible. The more easier it is for a patient to use, the more likely they are to use it. Our product is an easy to read large color display. We use one button start stop therapy. The only thing they have to do is turn it on and push a button. It automatically turns off. It tells the patients what to do. We can provide uh, a timer bar so they know how long is remaining in their therapy and everything is on screen as easy as possible for the patients to use. We also provide two applicators that can run simultaneously. This is excellent for patients with a large treatment site or a complicated treatment site, something like plantar fasciitis or Achilles tendinosis, where we've got to work not only the bottom of the heel, but the back or the sides. We can run these at the same time to help reduce the time, whereas competitive products that may only have one product or one applicator, if you need to use it on two applicator or two applicator sites or uh, on, a tr on a tricky site, uh, you double the treatment time, which is going to reduce the likelihood that the patient is going to use the product. So we make our product easy, flexible, and effective for the patients to use, because again, the more likely they are to use it, um, the, easier it'll, the easier it is, the more likely they will be to use it. The second thing that we as a company have developed in order to address patient use in the home is our patient support program. And this is really, I think, our key differentiator as a company. Our patient support program has three tenets. We provide a in-person, in-service, we provide follow-up calls, and we have our patient reporting structure. So even though we have an easy to use product, if we can't support the patients in the home, they just won't get positive, consistent outcomes. Now, we're going to go ahead and discuss the personal in-service in the times pre-COVID, but we've modified all of our settings to continue to do in-services virtually with the patients with a high rate of use afterwards. So our process has just changed to account for the COVID uh, uh, situation within the VA with patients in the home. When we do an in-service, we explain how the therapy works and we try to manage expectations so they know what to expect. We do a situational analysis. We try to set up what we call a treatment station. We don't drop off the product and say, good luck. We literally go in, work with the patients, find a spot in their home where they're likely to use it twice a day, help them set up the therapy, help them set up the device, as well as the applicators to how they'll actually be using it, and then get them through a treatment while we're there. We work with each patient on a schedule analysis to incorporate the therapies into their lifestyle. Do they have times in the beginning and end of the day when they can be in the same spot for half an hour to use our therapy? And then lastly, we want those patients to manage expectations. They shouldn't be feeling anything right off the bat. It typically takes the first month to see results um, if they stick with it, as well as a positive outcome taking up to four months or longer if it becomes a chronic long use patient. So we wanna make sure the patients know what to expect from a therapy as they're starting to use it. Internally, immediately after, we have our follow-up calls. We have a dedicated team of patient support representatives whose only job is to proactively call patients follow up with patients with the intention of motivating them to use the device as well as pull data on outcomes. So our first follow-up call is several days after an in-service, in which case we answer any questions that they might have. We make sure that they uh, know what to expect from the therapy. We make sure they're using it and starting to use it, as well as to do what we call showing them the mirror. Positive outcomes can be defined in a variety of ways and pain is very subjective. So while a patient may start with a pain level of nine and set a goal of getting down to a three, we also work with them to set goals in terms of mobility, uh, lifestyle improvements, and not only help them identify when those are occurring, but record them and, and get them back to the doctors to show that we're providing a positive outcome if pain reduction is at a lower rate. So the other thing we do here in the calls is after our initial immediate follow-up, after an in-service, we do calls at a minimum of once a month if the patients will allow us to do so, uh, more if possible. Uh, we follow them regularly. Uh, we build rapport. Each patient service representative is assigned to one patient, which means when patients call, they never get a call center with a bunch of different people. They always end up speaking to the same person in our office. So they can build rapport and build a relationship with them, which again, further helps reinforce the, the sense of motivation that we want the patients to have. Um, in doing so, we try to help them overcome obstacles when they're using the device, whether they be physical or just mental, um, making sure that they're seeing a result or helping them identify the result. And then from those follow-up calls, we develop our patient report. 
Um, we break our reports into three functions and every representative gets this report every Friday. And we provide that to you as often as you will let us, which typically tends to increase as patient volume increases. Um, the trade-off is if we can get 20 to 50 patients out of your clinic, you'll still have to work with us to get outcomes on a regular basis to know what's happening with those patients in the home that you can then follow up with patients if needed to, to reaffirm uh, the progress that they're seeing. And we break our reports into three sections, action required, no action required, and recent disconnects. And action required typically means something like a renewal is, is needed, or we have to have a consult placed, or we're going to have to do a pickup. Uh, no action required means that this is just a patient update. The patient's doing well. This is the last time we spoke with them. Here's their pain score, et cetera. And then a recent disconnect is we show all disconnects in the last 30 days for whatever reason, whether the patient properly healed, there was no prescription, so we had to do a, a uh, disconnect for prescription, um, or the patient disconnected for some reason. We uh, inform everybody why patients are coming off of therapy um, on a regular basis. And like I said, this report comes out to every, uh, every representative of our organization, and we break them down by every prescriber for every facility. So your rep will have a personalized report for you for all of the patients that we're treating with all of their outcomes. Um, the VA uses a, a HIPAA secure email and we use a HIPAA secure email. However, we typically don't cross lines. These need to be done in person or over a fax if, if, if the worst case available. Um, so again, within COVID times, we're working with, with the doctors to provide this type of data virtually as best as we can um, in, in dealing with, with our processes through COVID. So the three main points of our organization and really the key takeaways are the personal in-services, which we've modified for COVID, the follow-up calls, which are integral to the success of our patients and our therapy in, in, the, in the field, and then lastly, our reporting to provide a positive, consistent outcome for the majority of your patients. The great thing about a rental product is that it's a low-risk product. So <clears throat> how do we work with you to identify the protocol and get patients online? We work to identify problem patients. And what we like to do is identify a protocol close where we work with you to say, when is it appropriate for our product to be used on your patients? And this goes back to the beginning when we talked about your standard protocols. The majority of your patients are gonna be treated and, and with success on a variety of lower cost, lower risk issues uh, or, or modalities. But when appropriate, Replexa Plus can be an absolute product that will help your patients when they're, when they're identified under these problem chronic patients. So if we were to move through something again like plantar fasciitis, we know that you're gonna go and ice and stretch the patient, and then we're gonna move to an orthotic, and then we're gonna move to a offloading boot. And then you might try other modalities like a TENS unit or a PENS unit, the precutaneous, um, or something else, an ice therapy, uh, some other lower cost, easier product. At that point, Replexa Plus is probably a good candidate. Uh, the problem with shots, as you all know, is they are invasive. Uh, the steroids have a diminishing rate of return. They can only get so many a year and long-term use can actually um, damage the fascia. And then of course, surgery is a high cost, highly invasive procedure that we want to avoid at all costs. So in the case of a plantar fasciitis patient, once a patient has passed all of these other modalities and they're in clinic regularly, and they're now moving into shots, that's where we want to be used. Um, when you have patients and you have a, a list of your patients who uh, have upcoming shot appointments or who may have surgery in a few months coming up, um, those are excellent candidates for our product that we want to work with you guys. And that's where we can do what we call the protocol close is working with you to identify appropriate points in protocols for a variety of patient types. Um, we don't want to be a first pass. And like I was saying earlier, the great thing about a, a, a rental product like ours is that you can try it with very low risk to the VA. If for some reason the patient's not using it, which obviously is the case and we will have, um, we can just disconnect the patient. The VA doesn't have to purchase any of these. As an organization, we also will prorate all costs uh, from renting the device towards a purchase if you identify patients who may be a chronic patient um, in that case, we'd have a patient on for several months. We take them off. We see if uh, they, their issue comes back. And if so, we can just put them back on uh, and we'll prorate any types of rentals against the cost to help keep the cost of the VA down. We just think that's the right way to do business. So um, our value prop is, is working on uh, hard to heal chronic patients, patients who are in your clinic regularly. Um, we wanna support uh, you obviously in your clinic and help to reduce uh, your volume if possible. And in doing so, extend ourselves to be almost a part of your clinical team in the, in the field, 
where we're providing active reporting to you on what we do as a product, what your patients are seeing, the types of outcomes that we're getting, and get you that data back on a regular basis um, so that your patients can still get care in the home um, as opposed to being in clinic. Uh, for more information, please visit promedtech.com um, or replexa.com, R-E-P-L-E-X-A. You can go to the contact us section and um, send us a direct message and we'll respond to you in your clinics um, with any information that you might want. Thank you very much. That was a terrific session. And next, next, I'd like to welcome you to the question and answer. We have Marie Williams, Alex Kahn, and Paul Hazer. I'll be the moderator. And if you have questions, we'd like to hear from you.